Welcome everybody, very happy to be here on the security talk uh, track. So as Charles said, I'm, I work for Styra. We are the company behind the Open Policy Agent, which is a very interesting tool for implementing authorization. And today I'm going to walk you through uh, why would you use it, in what scenarios is it useful, and what is authorization anyway? So, let's say we have somebody who wants to access the backend of Superbank. We have two uh, tasks that we need to do at, in, at this point. We need to identify who this person or maybe system is, and we need to make sure they can only do things that we want to allow them to do. So, the authentication part is these days, uh, especially for end users, a pretty well solved problem. There are companies like Okta who just provide it out of the box, many different authentication methods. It's, it's pretty straightforward for many use cases. Of course, probably an authentication person from Okta would now say that, oh no, it's not that easy. There are all kinds of edge cases and everything to handle. But uh, generally, it's a process that's, that's simpler than authorization because we have well-defined uh, actors like end users using a web browser or their mobile phone or another system that, that we need to authenticate. So Styra and the Open Policy Agent is explicitly focused on solving the other side of the problem, which is the authorization problem. So let's say we know that uh, our uh, customer support agent, that's why he's called Agent Brown, because uh, he wants to access the backend to provide customer support services to the clients of Superbank. And uh, Agent Brown successfully logged into the system. And now we need to determine what is Agent Brown allowed to do. And to make things more complicated, we don't just want to say Agent Brown can or cannot access the backend of Superbank. We actually want a little bit more fine-grained access control. Uh, we want Agent Brown to be able to view accounts, list the transactions on clients' accounts, but we don't want Agent Brown to be able to block a client's account because of reasons. And we have another agent called Agent Smith who will be able to block an account. And we have different ways to implementing this. And all these ways, there, is, there are two aspects to this. One is uh, we, we need to define our way of basically defining uh, what, how, how, how do we want to express that what a user can and cannot do to our system. And then we need to enforce this, and that enforcement will be very specific to the system where we are trying to enforce it. You'll, it will start to make sense in a moment. So, uh, the probably most popular way of implementing authorization is RBAC, which is, it stands for Role-Based Access Control, where we assign roles to uh, our users and then assign permissions to these roles. So basically the users will, the permissions will be grouped into roles. Certain roles can, uh, can do something. I actually kind of left out the, uh, the, let's say the customer support role or customer support, high level customer support, lower level customer support role. Uh, there are many different ways to do this. Um, you can also group the users into, into groups of users. So you don't have to assign permissions to or roles to every single user. But the, the point I'm trying to make on this slide with RBAC is that it's a very data-driven way of authorization. We actually have to have a database of mappings between our users and the permissions that we want to give them. And this is how Kubernetes does authorization. It's, it's, uh, it's very useful in scenarios where basically any user could have any permission and any other user could have any, a completely different set of permissions from that user. And basically in this way we can express this. And also we can, uh, we manipulate all of this as data, which is very useful if we want to, for example, provide a nice UI on, uh, on top of this where let's say an administrator can just click some checkboxes to, uh, to configure. However, the downside of RBAC is, is this data heaviness. 
anything, whenever we add the new user, we have to assign them to their groups, we have to assign uh, the roles to the groups, and all this management of this data, especially as it grows, will get more and more difficult. Even though we might actually have certain patterns in our users that we could just uh, utilize. So the another way to, to actually utilize certain, certain patterns in our users is ABAC. So now we assign attributes, so ABAC stands for attribute-based access control. So we assign uh, a level to uh, Agent Brown and Agent Smith, and we'll authorize them just based on this one attribute of their what level of customer support agent are they. And then we, it's enough for us to define the minimal level for each uh, permission, for each action they can do. And with this, we can express in a much more concise way the, the relationship between our users and, and the actions they perform. The, this is very nice, but it can't always be done this way. And the other downside is that now we have to have certain some code running somewhere that will match what does mean level mean on the, on the uh, action or permission side, and how does it relate to the level of the agent. So is it maybe that uh, the agent's level has to be equals or greater than min level, or does it have to be uh, greater? We, this, this doesn't tell us that, so we'll have to implement that somewhere. And basically, ABAC-based authorization systems do exactly that, but it's not going to be that flexible. You cannot easily play with these relationships. And that's how we arrive at policy-based access control, which is the, the con access control method that uh, the open policy agent implements. It's, uh, it's a way, this is exactly the same as we've seen in the, in the ABAC example, but it's implemented using a policy language. So now, because we actually have this policy language, we can play with it. We can change and tweak it and make it more complex, make this policy more complex, for example, by coming up with a crazy policy that uh, customer support agents can only access the system during work hours. And this we can express in a PBAC policy very, very easily. And because it's also a programming language, we can also access data. So we can flexibly, we can load, let's say, the bank opening times as data into the agent, and we can use those to, uh, to determine the time. We can also do abstractions because, again, programming language, so we don't have to repeat ourselves so many times. We can create a function that is, uh, that's the veer open function and move the, uh, the uh, criteria in there. So we can see that suddenly we have way more power to express the authorization decisions that we want to see in our system. But uh, in return, we have to actually learn a policy language. So, uh, to recap this part of the talk, uh, basically, these, the relationship between these different uh, methods of authorization is they are supersets of each other. So, basically, you, using policy-based access control, you can implement an RBAC system. You could replace Kubernetes RBAC with your own open policy agent-based uh, policies. You can also create an ABAC uh, policy system using, uh, using PBAC. And ABAC can basically be an RBAC system by just saying that the uh, roles of a user is an attribute and it will be a more flexible RBAC system, basically. So the Open Policy Agent is a CNCF project. Now it's, it was developed by the founders of Styra back like uh, about six years ago. And it's a general purpose policy, ang lang uh, policy engine. So it actually executes the, those policies that I was showing before. And it can do this in many different scenarios. So it's uh, one of the trickiest things to understand about the open policy agent. People, for example, use this as admission controller on Kubernetes through Gatekeeper. And they don't even know really that there are other uses of it. But uh, but the uh, OPA is a really, really flexible tool, and we'll be showing some. Uh, I'll be showing some uh, some interesting use cases for it today. Um, it's also a major open source project. 
just like to show this that uh, that this is uh, becoming a bit of a de facto standard in uh, in many uh, authorization scenarios so it's a safe bet to uh, to go and and use it and here are all those use cases that i mentioned uh, so all these all these tools support various degrees of integration with OPA. There are actually many tools out there that under the hood use OPA without even uh, really exposing it. But uh, you can see that this, this is this is all those use cases I was mentioning. And the next topic is zero trust. So Matt, if you were here for the previous talk, already was talking a lot about zero trust using Istio, and the idea of zero trust is, and, and I'm going to do very similar things, but with OPA. So uh, the idea of zero trust is that you never ever trust any call either between services or coming from users just because, let's say, the user has authenticated already or just because another service is running on the same network as the service being called. You do authorization on every single point uh, between inside a microservice or whatever system that you have built. So, in our case, the the in the super bank backend, if we zoom in on that and we, we look at the user and the service relations, so the user first accesses the portal that renders the web page, then the user goes to get their permissions and the uh, and some account data. Um, all these calls would be individually authorized by each service on the back end if we want to do a proper zero trust architecture. And by the way, zero trust means a lot of things. I'm going to be talking about a subset of that. Um, we also see that the account service is calling the account holder service. So that needs to be authorized too, based on maybe the ID of the service or even whose behalf is the service making the call to the other service. And there is also a status service that can call any service, but only a certain endpoint of any service to gather up uh, status information. So yeah, so just to stop here for a moment, the, the, this all sounds very nice, but the interesting part is how actually to implement this efficiently. And one of the ways that, well, the default way for many years for development teams to do something like this is just write some code or use some language specific framework like Spring Security to bake some authorization logic into, into, the, into the services, which in many cases can be fine for simple enough applications and for a homogeneous tech stack. But as soon as, in this case, we have a Python service there, we'll have a, an, an Nginx service just serving up static content that doesn't even really have a very good authorization uh, functionality, and some Java services, this becomes increasingly difficult to maintain. The, and, and also the policies become very hidden inside the, the code of the application. And when you're in the infrastructure world, usually you are con uh, you are constrained to whatever your tools provide right so aws iam kubernetes rbac and so on but wherever you the the system is extensible by making an external authorization call to the open policy agent suddenly you can do way more and doing this from the code of a service is always possible because from code you can make a call out to any external service and that external service can be the open policy agent and the open policy agent can make authorization decisions for you. However, that still requires quite some coding. So actually Istio or another service mesh is the thing that provides us with a very, very good extension point for uh, for doing authorization without having to touch every single service. And how it happens is the traffic on Istio will travel through uh, Envoy proxies attached to every single, uh, every single service. So before the status service, the portal service, or any service would be hit, uh, it will go through Envoy. But newer versions of Istio are now changing this, but doesn't really matter for our purposes today. The, and Envoy can be configured to 
call out to an external authorization service that will then say yes or no, basically. Is this, is this request allowed or is this request denied? And basically, what we'll do here, we inject OPA into every single pod of the application and have Envoy call out to localhost 9191, where OPA is receiving gRPC calls and receive a response from OPA on whether the request is allowed. So Istio will basically wrap up the request into a big JSON structure with all the details, and then OPA can make a decision whether it's allowed. And this way, in front of every single service, we will have a an authorization point that we can manipulate very easily using OPA's regular language. And it's demo time. I had some trouble preparing the demo. It, uh, the demo gods were not kind to me, so let's hope that actually during the live demo they will be. Okay. Um, yeah, let's actually start here. So this is the login screen of uh, of Superbank, and now we will log in with our uh, with our customer support agents. So let's start with age. Okay, no, this is still okay. It's just key cloak sometimes does that. So here we are with Agent Smith. Um, let's make this a little bit uh, bigger. Or it's yeah, this screen is pretty big, so it's okay. So Agent Smith is a level three customer support agent, and he is responsible for the EU territory. And right now, and here are some bank accounts uh, we can see as Agent Smith and. Agent Smith opens the details of a bank account of Mr. Anderson or the transactions, and basically he's allowed to do whatever at this moment. Now, let's apply some policy to this application. So all those agents that I was showing on this slide, they all can update the policy that is running in them. If we push the policy to a, uh, I'm using a uh, Google Cloud bucket, uh, cloud storage bucket. Whenever the policy gets updated in the Google Cloud Storage bucket, all these open policy agents will update it. There are other ways to get policy into them, but this is a, a pretty neat way to do that. And so what we will do, here is the policy just commented out. For me, to, I don't want to do live coding too much today. That's uh, way too stressful. But first of all, what we will do is we'll say that the allow rule by default is false. So we go with a default deny uh, policy. Uh, we can even try this out. So now if I go build bundle, what build bundle does, it's a very simple little script. It builds policy out of my policy file, builds a policy bundle out of my policy files, which just is a zip file with a tar gz file, and then pushes that up to my uh, my bucket. And if all goes well, now Agent Smith should have access to absolutely nothing. All right? <laughs> we got this far. So now, let's give Agent Smith access to the portal. Basically, here we are saying the portal should be uh, accessible to anybody, uh, which is just a static part of the of the website, even without authentication. We need this because the portal, then the JavaScript in the portal redirects to the uh, to uh, sorry. Oh, undefined function spiffy. Yeah, okay. I didn't try it. I thought during the talk to let's do it differently and just uncomment these things one by one. But uh, actually, why not? This is just the the helper functions need to be. Uh, Need to be uncommented here. Ah, there we go. So now uh, it takes a few seconds, of course, for the agents to update. There we go. So now agents can't do, or like the user can't do anything, but at least uh, the static part of the of the web page loads. And and now let's go for the more interesting uh, policies. So. Uh, 
behind the scenes, the first call that the uh, website does is to the permission service, and we want to allow that if a JOT token has been parsed. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't introduce that part. So when the user uh, authenticates with Keycloak, uh, the, it re, uh, they'll receive a JSON web token, which is basically a token that's an that contains all their data. This is an actual example of the, of the JSON web token. It's encoded as a string that can be put into an HTTP header, and it's signed, so it's, it's secure. Uh, it, uh, it prevents tampering, and we can see that the, the user has the role customer support that we will be using. It's a role level two. This is actually Agent Brown's token. So these are the things that we will be using from this uh, JSON web token, because whenever Envoy is calling the Open Policy Agent, it will forward all the data of this uh, of, a, of a request to the Open Policy Agent. I can show a request here. This is how it looks like, how, how, is the, data, how the data looks like uh, that uh, Envoy sends to the Open Policy Agent. So here are the, uh, the destination address with the SPIFI ID, very important. This is what we can use to actually know which service is being called, because IP addresses don't mean anything on Kubernetes. Here are all the headers. Uh, somewhere in these headers should be the author authorization header with, the, uh, uh, with that. Why don't I see it here? I don't know. Maybe this is the wrong request I saved here. Um, anyways, so. Yeah, this is a request coming from the ingress gateway to the portal index.html. So all this, all the request data is sent to the open policy agent, and then we can write rego policy to make decisions based on this. So if we go back to, uh, to here, uh, this is a very important policy here, which says that if someone is trying to call the account service, they, has to ha they have to have the customer support role in their Realm Access roles, and that role will have to be at least level two. And if they are calling the, uh, the transactions, then their level will have to be at least three. So let's, uh, let's try out this policy now. This means that for Agent Smith, nothing should really change because he can see his level three. So, okay, now we're denying something that we did not want to deny. Ah, yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna uncomment everything because it's, uh, it's, uh, there are other things that, uh, that need to be able to call each other. So uh, Agent Smith can now call the uh, see these accounts, but if I log in as Agent Brown, who is just level two, then Agent Brown will not be able to see transactions. Yes. <laughs> I'm sweating here. <laughs> okay. So, um, and now what we want to do is we also want to make sure that an agent assigned to one territory or geolocation is uh, only able to access accounts from, from that territory. So we'll just use the par parse the first two letters of the uh, IBAN code from here to do that. So basically add some more policy where account territory uh, has to be the same as jwt.georegion and apply this policy now. Yes. All right. So you can see that what we have implemented here, this is, this is very hardcore policy-based access control, meaning that, yeah, this doesn't really use any data. We could use data in this policy. Let's say we could, now we are, now we are for example, getting the role of the user from the JSON web token. Maybe our authentication system would not provide that data. And in that case, we would have that to get that data maybe from some other internal system. 
In that case, we could load that into the open policy agent, that data, and, uh, and access it here by calling, let's say, data users, uh, user ID, something, something. So we could, we could actually use that data in here, and then we would make our policy a bit more data-driven. Um, or we could even implement an RBAC system here. And why it's interesting, actually, it would sound like very unwieldy to implement RBAC in Rego, uh, but actually many of our customers do something like that because they, want, they need like RBAC plus or ABAC plus, where uh, they mostly need RBAC, but then also a few extra policies that can be better expressed not using RBAC. And in that case, uh, it's better to then do it all in, uh, in Rego. The same is true of, uh, of Istio's uh, authorization, right? Istio has native authorization policies that can be configured. So it's actually, uh, you could use those, but they will only get you as far and then you either add some Rego to that, or you just do everything in Rego. It's a, for example, here is the, the policy that says that the status service can call, if the source is status, it can call anything as long as, the, as it's calling the slash status endpoint, basically. So on any service, it can call the slash status endpoint. And uh, this could be expressed using Istio authorization policies. But these two authorization policies are basically configuration, so they're not that flexible as, uh, as Rego code. So there are, there are always a point where it starts to be more worth using the Rego, and, uh, and it's, um, everybody has to make the decision at some point when, when is this, uh, this really a good idea. Um, the same, uh, one interesting thing to mention, uh, especially at an SRE conference, is also that, like, Maybe the most popular use case for OPA is, of course, Kubernetes admission control. So integrating OPA with Kubernetes and saying whether this thing could be deployed and or not. And, uh, and that's also a, a great use case. In that case, it's less authorization and more like, uh, more like what's allowed to be deployed on the cluster, but is the same mechanism and it works perfectly. So, uh, so totally go ahead and, and do that. The, interestingly, the same investment in Rego will be paying off when doing Kubernetes admission control or authorizing users on Istio. So it's also, um, maybe Rego is not the easiest thing to learn if you do like more complex stuff because yeah, it's a programming language, but the investment into it basically allows you to unify authorization, user authorization, system-to-system uh, -system communication authorization, Kubernetes admission control, and even other use cases into a single uh, technology stack. And the final slide that I have here is basically how to distribute the policy. So, uh, so the, the, the point of OPA is poli having policy as code, right? All your policies are code. Of course, you'll put them into, into Git. And then you can have a pipeline that runs tests on those policies. Uh, OPA supports unit testing. And then you push those policies uh, to a bundle server. And the bundle server could be a simple thing like a cloud bucket or S3, or there, there is uh, Styradas, which is our basically managed bundle server and authoring environment and all kinds of things that can be then used to load the policy into the open policy agents wherever they are running. So this is one way of deploying OPA, is to deploy it next to the Istio proxy uh, to Envoy and have one like this is what we were talking mostly today. But you could deploy OPA as a centralized service also with load balancing and, uh, and uh, yeah, with load balancing multiple instances, high availability, et cetera. Um, yeah, and that's, that's the last point I wanted to make. So I have to think about how to get the policies to the open policy agents. Thank you very much for listening.